Turn me on. Ah. We'll be starting in five minutes, so if you can start to make your way back in, we'd really appreciate that. microphone is still on. <laughs> yes. Like exactly like this morning. Yeah. So I'll call you up. Ocean race. Just another reminder, we're starting in, I would say, about one minute now. I'm trying to whisper to people here, and it doesn't work when you have a microphone on. <laughs> so I see quite a few people still on the deck. If we could encourage everybody to come in so that um, the speakers get everybody's attention. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to sit again for the conference of 2 p.m. starting in some minutes. Welcome, Natalie. So next topic, crowdsources data collection for super yacht. Our main moderator, David Hill, here on the stage. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> I just want to thank my team, Baptiste, Mia, and Whitney. Thanks for them.
please have a seat, press your seat belt. We we'll start to land for the second conference of the day, the first conference of the day, data collection for super yachts crowd sourced. So again, welcome for the conference of the afternoon, Crossroads Data Collection for Super Yacht. David Silas, the main moderator. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. I actually managed to have my lunch without spilling any chicken stir fry down my new Monaco Yacht Club shirt. Actually, it's moments like having lunch at the Monaco Yacht Club on the deck that kind of refreshes my enthusiasm for the industry. You probably feel the same way. Uh, you know, in this industry, we work with one of the most spectacular products on Earth. We meet some of the most interesting people possible to meet. Uh, the business is fascinating and we enjoy such great food and wine in so many great places. If you work in yachting, it's quite likely you regularly visit Monaco, Barcelona, Miami, Italy, where we have great food and wine. And very often I reflect on the fact that in just over 25 years in the industry, I must have drunk so many thousand glasses of different kinds of wine. I just wish that my brain worked in a way that I could catalog all those different sorts of wines and remember, what they were. If I had that brain that's able to remember what is a good wine, what's not such a good wine, the years of wine, how to pair one wine with another, then when somebody gives me a wine list, I could look at it with some intelligence. As it is, I look at a wine list the same way that sometimes I look at the engine room of a yacht. I pretend I know what I'm looking at, but actually, a lot of it baffles me. I mean, I know if something is MTU engines or Caterpillar engines. I know that Pinot Noir is red. I know that Pinot Grigio is white. But so much information and knowledge I've lost over the years. And I think that goes generally for humankind. We live through our life and we learn so much. We take in so much data, but we forget more than we ever learn. And the purpose of this afternoon's discussion is to pick up on that subject with yachts. Yachts are sailing throughout the world in different latitudes, different climates, different weathers, different hemispheres, different water quality. All of that data is so easy to lose if only there was a way to collect that data together. The good news is there is. It's called Supiot Crowdsourcing Data Collection. It's a lot easier than I ever believed that it would be. Uh, it's a lot more popular than I was aware of, and it's something that we're going to really investigate in detail this afternoon. We have a lot of speakers to talk about this to us, so I'm going to give you the list in reverse order. That way, when I get to the last one, they'll be the first one to actually come on stage. So we have Farouk Nefsi. Farouk, I just met for the first time properly a few moments ago. He's always been a hero of mine because he's the chief marketing officer of FedShip. Uh, marketing of FedShip I admire very greatly, but he's not actually here to talk about that. But rather one of their yachts, which is called Archimedes, which is collecting data for National Geographic. That promises to be really fascinating. We also have Michel André. Michel is a professor and a bioacoustician. He's here to talk about noise pollution. I have to tell you, when I saw noise pollution on the program, at first I thought, really? Noise pollution? I mean, I know plastics are a problem because we see photographs of a penguin with a plastic ring around its beak, or, or, or I know about carbon emissions being a very real problem, but noise? Is it really worth our time talking about that? 
Then I remembered about 25 years or more ago, I, I went on my first ever business trip on my own as a, as a young man to the island of Dominica. It was exhausting. There was a delay on the flight, there were all kinds of problems. I eventually crawled into my hotel room, exhausted, looked out of the window and saw a sight that you only ever see in the Caribbean. They were putting up loudspeakers in the hotel courtyard the size of this room for a reggae concert outside of my room. Well, in my early 20s, I mean, these days I'd check out and I'd move to another island, I think, to get away from it. But in those days, in my 20s, I thought, well, if you can't beat them, join them. And I went down to the concert, and I will never forget these loudspeakers. It wasn't just the noise, it was the vibration. I could feel the vibration going all the way through my body. It was almost painful. And of course, sound has that effect. Sound in the form of music can elate us, it can make us cry, it can bring back memories. Sound can be used to irritate us, to torture people. Sound has even been weaponized. So noise is not something to be underestimated. And having had lunch with Michelle yesterday, it's absolutely fascinating, the information that he's bringing to us a little bit later on. We also have Luigi Sinapi. Admiral of the Italian Navy, and also the director of the Organisation Hydrographique Internationale. His specialization is in crowdsourced bathymetry program. In my opinion, this is one of the key points of this whole symposium, because he's not just talking about it in theory, but he can also tell us what practical things yachts can do and are doing to collate all of the data as they travel through the world's oceans. It's a fascinating subject and an important subject because it's one of those things that's not theoretical, but we can actually take action on. We also have Captain Matthias de Verl. Now, Matthias, I think you're Matthias. <laughs> Matthias is the captain of uh, the motor yacht Queen Aida, and he's actually been involved with that yacht in data collection. Marnix. Marnix Hoekstra from Freeback, the very, very famous yacht designers. And interesting to have a yacht designer here from a company that's actually implementing crowdsourced data collection into the design of their yachts. And he'll be telling us what practical steps they're taking to further progress this idea of collecting data. And Cecile Turner, who I met a, a few moments ago. And Cecile Turner is the sustainability director of the ocean race. Now, the ocean race is known as being sailing's greatest round the world challenge. You'd think that's difficult enough without them worrying about how to make racing purposeful, but that is her mission, racing with purpose, very much like yachting with sense, sailing with purpose. That will be fascinating too. Francois Mirabel and, and Fabrice Papassian. I met Fabrice uh, yesterday properly. They're the owners of the sailing yacht Ernst. That's Ernst, as in Ernest Shackleton. So that gives you an idea of what that yacht's done and where it's been, and the practical experience of two people who've been on a 47-foot sailing yacht in Antarctica with a view to doing that with sense and with purpose will be extremely interesting. Actually, a lot of this symposium is about bringing together yacht owners and bridging the gap with scientists, bringing yachting and science together to see how they can benefit each other. And there's no better example of that merger between science and yachts than the yacht Gene Machine and Gene Chaser. And we are honored today to have with us here uh, Dr. Bonnie E. Gold Rothberg, uh, the yacht owner and also MD, PhD, MPH, FACP, Yale School of Medicine. And I just had a very quick chat with Dr. Bonnie earlier and it promises to be a fascinating part of this symposium. This morning, I made a comment that um, yachting with sense needs to have sensible people speaking, but some of our speakers have done things which could be considered as far from sensible. The next speaker is a great example of that. A French free diver. You know what free diving is? It's when people jump and immerse themselves in the water without any particular equipment whatsoever. She has eight national records in all of the depths disciplines and three Guinness World Records. 
But listen to this: the longest swim under sea ice with a monofin in one single breath. What possesses somebody to do something like that? Well, soon we'll be hearing the purpose behind it and the mission of the great Aurora Asso. the Monaco Yacht Club to welcome me. It's an honor for me to be here because I do believe that it's the right moment, the momentum, to create a responsible yachting. I'm, I believe in this and I think uh, we can have a good example with uh, responsible yachting. So it's an honor to be part of this momentum. Myself, um, I would like to share my experience of navigation, which is not a navigation with a boat for now. I am myself a boat, if I can say, underwater. In 2012, I had a dream, and this dream was to feel myself as a seal navigating under the sea ice. That was my dream in 2012. And let me tell you uh, the origin of this dream. In, two, in September uh, 2012, we had the World Championships in the Bay of Villefranche-sur-Mer, uh, Villefranche very close to here. And I, ma I made a national record that was 76 meters depth. But uh, just two days later in the news, I saw another record, much more significant. And this record was the minimum of ice in the Arctic since the beginning of the satellite measurements in 1978. So it was 3.4 square kilometers for the surface in the Arctic for the ice cover. And I, it's this put me in, in a f reflection, record me, okay, just myself, uh, a freediver, and this uh, huge record at the time of a global warming. So I made myself a promise and I said, okay, I want to see the sea ice. I want to see this ecosystem. I want to navigate below. So I want to go there. So in 2015, I made an expedition. I organized everything by myself. It was very difficult. And this expedition, I call it One Breath for Arctica. So I went to Greenland and um, I met there a sailing boat uh, with a team under the pool for maybe people who know them. And I met the Inuit of Ikerasak, which is a beautiful Inuit village. And I started to feel this uh, ice and pure, icy and pure landscapes. And I felt very emotional in this uh, nature, in this big mother nature. And we started to dug holes and me to dive. And at the beginning, it was uh, completely um, difficult. I forget the picture, sorry. Where is the... The clicker. <laughs> so. Just to show you some pictures. Um, Yes, uh, at the beginning, when I went there, I had no visibility. It was like a green soup. And, but it's very interesting because uh, this green soup is actually the blooming of phytoplankton and the link with the global warming. I will explain to you, it's very simple. When the snow on the sea ice is melting, suddenly the light is crossing, can cross again the ice cover and so uh, all the phytoplankton is very happy to live again and have light for photosynthesis. So this phenomenon, which is completely natural and normal, is um, becoming earlier and earlier with the global warming because the, um, the snow cover and the sea ice are melting, so the light is coming uh, earlier inside the ice. So 
it was very difficult to, to dive at the first moment, but then I get my body and also my mind adapted and uh, little by little, I improved the distance and I could finally, after a long trainings, I could make the distance and the, the world record was um, at this moment 110. Uh, by a, a Turkish girl in a lake, um, I think in Switzerland. And me, I have to do more, and I did 112 meters under the sea ice. And it was very um, nice experience to witness this beauty and, and fragility of the sea ice ecosystem, but also to feel it with my flesh, mm -hmm. because when I was navigating under the sea ice, after any uh, difficulty that I could uh, face, I finally made my dream come true. At the end, I was feeling in this uh, world record dive like a seal navigating under the sea ice. So it was very beautiful. But there is a but. When I came back, um, I, I had this uh, great chance to make a conference in the um, Oceanographic Museum. So. We, um, I made a documentary, I could share it with people, we organized a little conference, I could make a conference between, to share my, my witness of this ecosystem at the time of the global warming. But then I felt a little bit depressed, and I know some of you who had great adventures in Arctic, or in Antarctic, when you come back, say, I'm sad, I want to go back. <laughs> so I made myself another dream after the Arctic, the Antarctic, of course. But there is another but. I was saying like, okay, if I go to the Antarctic, I don't want to go just for myself, my ego, and a record. No, no way. So I had question, and I have also a question for you. Uh, what do you think, what is the best to protect the Arctic and the Antarctic? Maybe not to go. But now the exploration, the time of exploration with um, uh, patriotism and you know, put the flag and stuff like this, it's gone. We don't want commercial, big commercial trips that are damaging nature. All of you in this uh, room, we know that we don't want this. But we still are human and we want to explore. We want to move, we want to see Mother Nature. So, in my new dream, it would be, I will go to dive in the Sea of Ross, which is the dream of my dreams, because it's the biggest marine protected area. This is pristine, this is not the Antarctic Peninsula, this is much far away, this is the end of the world, this is completely pristine. That's why it's the dream of my dream. But I will only go if I can go with uh, scientific people and with good uh, captain uh, and ship owners and people that uh, I will share this uh, philosophy with. And to finish my speech, as I don't want to be too long, um, this is uh, the answer of my big questions. Do you guys know what is this super yacht? The name of this super yacht. It's the Princess Alice the Second. So why is it an answer to my question, should I make my, my dream come true in Sea of Ross or not? This beautiful super yacht was the first private yacht to be used for oceanography by His Serene Highness Prince Albert I, as you know. And it was in the Arctic in Spitsburg. And this prince, his Serene Highness Prince Albert I, had a dream to go overseas, but not for himself. He wanted to go to help sciences and to give the people the taste of oceanography and ocean conservancy. Whereas one century ago, and as you know, it's the century of his death, it's a big year for this prince, commemoration. At this time, ocean conservation 
was not known. He was really, really the first one to tell about ocean conservation. So I will go in the Sea of Ross only if I can follow his steps and I will, I will be so happy to achieve my dream in this condition to dive under the sea ice of Sea of Ross. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aurore. As we mentioned, um, yachting is not just about sunbathing and, and enjoying exotic locations, but also can be used for scientific research. And now we have an esteemed scientist and doctor, uh, co-owner of uh, Gene Machine and Gene Chaser. We're happy to introduce Dr. Bonnie E. Gold Rothberg, MD, PhD, MPH, FACP. So, great, now I have to live up to that whole alphabet soup after me. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'm honored to be able to come here this afternoon and share with you some of the experiences of our gene machine. And today's story begins in 2017 when we sought to take um, a trip up to the Arctic. Uh, we actually started in Monaco and sailed all the way around the um, Iberian Peninsula, up through Norway, and encircled Svalbard. And as part of that, we achieved the furthest north latitude of any superyacht up to that point that was not of ice class. And here we are in front of the Jean Machine family, crew, um, definitely a momentous one. Um, time. And one of the things, though, that struck us is we encountered these waterfalls and were witnessing the melting of ice that had been frozen for 30, 40,000 years. And we're asking the question of are there special organisms, special forms of life that were preserved in the ice for all these years? And is there something that we can learn or at least benefit from the fact that we now have a glimpse into this era of the past. So we started on our mission of water collection samples with the plan of looking at the novel forms of life. And our story of the gene machine actually begins 20 years previous. Um, on July 2nd, 1999, when I made the mistake as a young, tired mother of hoping for a good night's sleep. My son here was born on July 2nd, and that first night I was like, you know what, I'm going to give him to the nursery and let the nurses take care of him so I can get a few hours of sleep. I woke up the next morning and I was told that he wasn't breathing fast enough and they wanted to observe him in the newborn nursery uh, for a couple of hours. So now I had the uh, responsibility the next morning of explaining to my husband, Jonathan Rothberg, that our son was in the intensive care unit. And he turned around and said, oh my God, is there everything okay? Um, I, had, I wish that I could sequence his genome to make sure that everything's fine. And I remember that was exactly the week that Intel announced the Pentium chip. And it was right at that time that the and uh, United States NIH was busy trying to sequence the first human genome, which actually was a mixture of about 40 different people all pooled together. And he said, you know what, no, that's not good enough. I don't want to know the collective genome of 40 people. I want to know the single genome of my son. And if Intel can come up with a Pentium chip that's going to be fast, I want to be able to make my own DNA sequencing device that's as fast as the Pentium chip. So that's actually what he was able to do with the ion torrent, um, which came out right after my son was born in 20, my other son in 2010. Um, and that revolutionized DNA sequencing by allowing individuals to sequence an entire human genome very quickly, very efficiently in about two, three, four hours. Um, and as you can see, this was the original gene machine. 
as the symbols from the ion torrent were what enabled us and what we've commemorated on our, um, on our uh, yacht. Um, Jonathan was awarded the National Medal of Technology from Barack Obama. We've been able to understand the woolly mammoth and Neanderthal using the gene machine, and it's been popularized in some fun movies like Contagion and Jurassic World. Um, but back to why we're really here today. So over the years, we've been collecting various samples. Um, my son, who was seven at the time, had so much fun bending over the canals around Amsterdam, getting some of the water from there. Um, and Jonathan, who is forever a scientist, forever an engineer, said, look, if I'm going to spend my summers on the yacht, then I need to bring the laboratory with me. And we took our salon and converted it into a wet lab with all of this fun apparatus. And here are two of my daughters learning from one of our interns that we had on the boat here, Hope, um, how to extract the DNA from these water samples and start our studies to understand all of the different forms of life and the different collections of life in water that is polluted and water that is less polluted. And the world fell apart in March of 2020 with COVID. So one of the things that we're actually really excited, um, not something you want to totally celebrate because COVID's never good in any circumstance, but that if it wasn't for technologies like Ion Torrent, we wouldn't have been able to track how COVID progressed from region to region. We wouldn't be able to understand the various new variants that are coming out and how each variant is spreading across the world. And, but nonetheless, in March of 2020, the world called to arms. Um, my practice is I work in the hospital taking care of cancer patients. We had just left for the Bahamas on spring break with our kids. I got a call from the hospital and I had to go right back to work. So we had to arrange for a seaplane to come pick me up from the Exuma so I can fly back to the United States. And I spent the next four months in the hospital taking care of patients as we danced around COVID. Jonathan felt jealous that I was going back and he wanted to do something. So in March 2020, he sent out a tweet saying, is it possible to manufacture a low cost COVID test that people can do in their homes that's of the same quality that we are sending off into the lab, that people can have a result within an hour so that they know whether they do or whether they don't have COVID, so they can protect their loved ones, they can protect their grandparents, they can protect those in their family that may have certain diseases that shouldn't be exposed, and that we can detect it before they actually feel sick. And so that began a two-year segue where now we have DETECT, which is available um, through the US FDA. And DETECT was essentially developed on the gene machine. Um, again, the laboratory that I had showed you for all the water samples got repurposed briefly. And here we are having the development of DETECT. But now we go back to the water samples and thinking about plastics in the ocean. And we know that plastics are a big problem. You guys heard yesterday from a lovely panel of speakers, but again, to remind you that 92% of plastic waste en enters either the oceans directly, landfills, or gets incinerated, and the pollution from the incineration um, contaminates the atmosphere. So we as a family have rebelled against Jonathan We've told him we want our salon back. And to the, his answer was, fine, I'm going to buy a second yacht, and I'm going to repurpose that as a personal laboratory. And that's actually been a lot of fun. We now have the Gene Chaser. Yes, fine, there's a ski boat in the back. But more impressively, we have laboratories inside. Um, we have a full now functioning wet lab on the boat. Um, up in the right corner here, I'm going to point it out. That's one of the ion torrent machines. Um, we have full capabilities, and then right next to it in the back of the hangar, we have a fully functioning machine shop with lathes, um, 3D printers, 
And this is now my youngest son, 11. Um, he has an interest in making hoverboards. You know what, we're gonna foster all of his creativity now because we don't know where it's going to lead. And again, just to briefly present some of the things that we're hoping to do with the gene chaser. As I mentioned, 92% um, of plastics ends up in pollutions. Really what our goal is to make it so that the um, ratio is inversed and that 92% of all plastic waste can be converted to perfectly reusable monomers. And here's our family not quite being able to free dive under the ice, but at least being able to enjoy the iceberg nonetheless. And our hope is that in the next year, we'd like to take a special trip to the Antarctic. Um, we invite you, Aurora, if you'd like to partner with us to do some science. Um, we're going to be bringing our youngest son as he turns 13 because he's been fascinated with the Antarctic since he's been three. With that, I thank all of you for your time, and it's been a, you know, a pleasure again. Thank you very much. Thank you, and there's an invitation that uh, we look forward to hearing the results of in, uh, in future times. So from a floating science lab accompanying a super yacht we moved to a 47-foot sailing yacht called Sir Ernst. And the two owners, uh, Francois Mirabel and Fabrice Papazian. Thank you, David. Thank you, buddy. Well, um, I'm not speaking about DNA. I'm going to speak about Drigongen, or what? Um, Make, uh, make your life a dream and a dream a reality. This sentence from uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry re, uh, reunited them, Hervé Perrin and Fabrice, and also pushed them to go from uh, Monaco to Antarctica with a, a small sailing boat. And um, that's why I'm, first of all, sorry, I'm very proud and very happy to share our experience. Thanks for the Yacht Club of Monaco to give them the opportunity to share our experience in Antarctica. Um, so we left uh, Monaco in early in uh, September and we reached Antarctica in um, February. We spent one month and um, in addition to, to realize our dream, we want our dream to be useful. Um, useful for the environment. So we are amateur, phot photograph amateur, but through our photo, video, we, we want to, to touch a large people to, and to, to tell them that Antarctica is very important for the climate. Uh, we want to be useful for the um, education and for the kids. So we have done a, a partnership with some schools and um, we give them the opportunity to, to have a immersive and um, positive and um, original way of education. So we had live uh, from the boat. And, um, and also we want to be useful for the science. And uh, we have done bathymetric measure, and um, Fabrice will, uh, will explain uh, what we have done uh, precisely about uh, bathymetric measure. Thank you. Uh, we, have, uh, we have done uh, some uh, meteorologi meteorological uh, uh, measurement that we sent to Meteo France. But also, we, we realized by uh, navigating uh, in, the, in the Antarctic and using the maps that a lot of the maps are, are white. You see only the, 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 the track of the coast, but you have no, 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 no depth on, on, on the... And, uh, and so that, that uh, uh, 
we, 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 had, the, we had the opportunity to meet uh, 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 the, the IHO, which is the International uh, Hydrographic Organization in Monaco, founded by uh, Pri Prince Albert uh, I. And uh, we, we contributed to uh, the um, uh, to to collect data uh, for 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 mapping the, uh, the 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 seabed. We 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 participated to a project that is called Seabed 2030, and uh, that has a, a component that is. Uh, uh, collective and crowdsourced bathymetry. So that's that's an an easy. Uh, there is a, an easy way for the for the for the for the, the yachts and the, the, the vessel navigating uh, throughout uh, uh, the, the the sea to to collect this data. Uh, they provide a very, a very simple logger that uh, I have here that I can show you uh, that we have connected to our uh, to our navigational system because there is a, an international standard that uh, allow, allow us to, to communicate between between all these systems. And uh, this, this logger logs the position, the depth, and, uh, and the time. And uh, uh, the data is logged simply on a USB key. And this USB key, the content, has been sent back to the, to the organization to uh, improve the, the database. This is all our uh, personal pictures from uh, Antarctica. Um, well, <laughs> it's a short. Can, can, can I ask you the um, the the gadget there that, yeah. uh, that logs the data? Is that connected to the depth sounder and the Exa GPS? Exactly, it's connected to the to the GPS and the depth sounder. It's it's very easy to to to, to integrate to to every ship. It doesn't need any 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 new system on the ship, and so if uh, uh, other other boats uh, use this system, it will contribute to knowing more about about the depth. And can, for can you give me a ballpark can, price on that if somebody wants to sorry? get one? If what, what more or less is the price of buying something like that? This two hundred euro. <laughs> 200 euro, and you literally just plug it in? Yeah. Do you need any specialist to fit it, or? Every electronic guy of working on a boat can, can use it. So that's, it's very simple. It can be used by, by a lot of yachts, little and super yachts. And uh, we, if you can go forward. The, the, we had the first the first data of uh, of uh, uh, the analysis of our track, and this this photograph shows that uh, in in black there are where uh, other ships have have got uh, already done measurements, and in color the the, the data that is uh, extrapolated from satellite source, which is not in the database and, and uh, so it shows that with with our boat we we sailed in areas where uh, it was not uh, completely charted and uh, this this is a contribution that will enter in this global database and be shared by uh, by um, uh, by the, the the organization to every sci scientist so we went up. In fact, we have we have made our voyage. If you can go back on the on the map, ah, yeah, uh, we see that that's a, a part of the peninsula 
with the Adelaide Island and uh, the Marguerite Bay. And uh, our, our initial uh, uh, project was to follow the track of Commander Charco, who discovered Marguerite Bay in 1909 and uh, sailed in this area and discovered this place. And uh, we, we had the opportunity to, to, to visit that with our little sailing boat. Uh, and so we, for us, it's uh, the realization also of our, of our dream because uh, doing this type of modest contribution is giving us the feeling that we share a little bit the adventure of those guys who lived uh, an incredibly demanding and challenging adventure at that, at that time. Well, thank you both very much. That was really, really fascinating. Thank you. And from slowly, steadily exploring the Antarctic, we talk about racing around the world in a sailing yacht in the form of the ocean race. And we'd invite Anne-Cecile Turner, who's the sustainability director of the ocean race. Good afternoon, everyone. How many of you know the ocean race? Okay, there's a maybe 50-50. So for those who don't know, the Ocean Race uh, ancestor was uh, called the Whitbread, and then the Volvo Ocean Race. Uh, we are celebrating 50 years of existence next year. And uh, we like to call ourselves the, the pinnacle of offshore racing. So I hope uh, it's gonna talk to a crowd of ocean lovers. Um, and during the last edition of the race, uh, we've launched a program called Racing with Purpose. And I really loved to, uh, to see, uh, um, what's, your, what, what's yours? Uh, yachting, with yachting with sense. With sense. Yes. <laughs> and I, I think it's, uh, it shows uh, how our visions are aligned. Um, and uh, last time we, we launched uh, an award-winning uh, program, uh, it was really... Um, using the power of the sport to raise awareness about ocean preservation. And the thinking was, did you know that 17% of the people follow science, but 70% of the people follow sport? So we felt that, of course, science is absolutely essential to understand what's at stake. But why don't we use you know, this uh, universal um, element and very emotional connection that people can have with sport to pass on a message. So using the voice of sport to raise awareness about ocean preservation and ocean challenges. Basically our playground is threatened, we all know that. And uh, we felt we had a, a responsibility but also an opportunity to do something. So last time it was about ocean plastic pollution. We created a program uh, in partnership with UN Environment called the Clean Seas Turn the Tide on Plastic. We even had a boat named Turn the Tide on Plastic. And uh, we won almost seven awards, one of them at the um, Dusseldorf Boat Show by the Monaco Foundation, so thank you uh, for your recognition. And it was a recognition from the industry to say, well, this has a meaning and we can go even further. So this edition, the next uh, edition of the Ocean Race uh, will be starting in January 23, so next year from Alicante. We're going to go around the world in uh, eight stopovers. And um, we, we raised the level of our ambition uh, to talk about ocean health as general. Um, we're going to talk about, um, of course, uh, ocean and climate. As we know, we, there is a big topic, and ocean is always almost forgotten at the table of climate negotiation. So we need to raise the voice of ocean, how important it is in our future lives and our humanity. And, Every other breath we take, we owe it to the ocean. We know that, so it's very important as a carbon sink as well. Uh, the second one is uh, ocean protection, and we have a lot of organizations already working on these topics. And the third one is ocean rights. So that's a new area that we're going to uh, talk about. And actually, uh, right as we speak, uh, at the first uh, level of this uh, prestigious institution, uh, Prince is also talking about uh, this, this topic. 
uh, in the idea of really using um, the race to organize, we, we are at the 13th Ocean Race Summit, to gather influencers of the world, to gather leaders, to actually take a stand to showcase you know, the power of the, our voice and to, in, a, in order to accelerate ocean preservation. To recognize that ocean has such a value that it needs to be protected, it needs to be protected through ocean rights. So we are designing a group of international lawyers and institutions in the idea to draft the principle of a universal declaration of ocean rights. It's very ambitious, far way beyond our shoulders, but uh, we have a very good traction so far. The second element of our program is uh, the education program. As a mother of two, uh, we know that uh, we're just borrowing the planet uh, to our kids, uh, that they are going to borrow it to their kids, and we need to really make sure that they understand what's at stake. So we've created a program uh, prim for primary schools uh, that is now reaching more than 50 countries, more than 250,000 kids. We're launching the program for secondary schools and we also have a program for adults in order to learn what's at stake you know, and how to uh, use our uh, resources to actually uh, give them some uh, education uh, tools for themselves and in their organizations. Um, so that's very important for us as well, and we saw yesterday Boris Herman, uh, as well as a sailor, talking about ocean uh, to the group of schools from Monaco, and it was really uh, heartwarming, and we're doing that all around the world with all the schools uh, of whole cities. And um, the topic I was uh, asked to talk about today is ocean science. And uh, <clears throat> during the last edition of the race, we had only one class of boat, the 65 feet, and uh, it was a journey, I have to say, to convince the sailors that are cutting their toothbrush to gain weight in order to uh, you know, <laughs> sail fast, to actually take more than 40 kilos of scientific equipment on board to contribute to ocean knowledge and understanding. And at the beginning, nobody understood wh why I was doing that. You know? And um, so we succeeded in, in gathering uh, data thanks to a group of very motivated people. One of them is in the room, actually, Mathieu, thank you <laughs> for your participation. Um, and uh, we created a scientific consortium in order to be able that not only that our program was scientifically credible, so to be the best uh, ocean scientist, um, you know, in, in, I wouldn't say the world, but, uh, you know, to understand what, what, what's at stake, making sure that we are analyzing the data properly. Uh, we've actually been published in a peer-reviewed paper, so that's really establishing the credibility of our science program. Uh, we collected uh, microplastic um, sampling, and so we, we've been able to create maps of microplastic concentration, and it was the first time we did that, and the reason why, as everybody knows he, know here, is that we are going in the Southern Ocean, in, in areas where you know, it's very expensive to pay scientific expedition to go there. We also know that the ocean is understudied, so we have really not a lot of uh, data about the ocean, so going there, with these kind of boats, you know, gathering data is very important. We also collected weather data to improve the weather forecasts, uh, and it, you can al almost see live, you know, how it is benefiting from the sailors to have this weather data, because it's helping them to improve their, their weather patterns and their speed on, on the water. Um, and, and we also collected CO2 concentration, chlorophyll, salinity, sea surface temperature. So really. We are a little bit like a, you know, a surgeon or, or a doctor you know, taking the vitals of the ocean, trying to understand what's at stake. And we are a minuscule drop you know, in an ocean of, of data collectors, and we have a lot of people here in the room doing that. But what's at stake, I think, here now is that the, we need to make a, a very strong effort from that data to go away from only the scientific publications and to spread across the general public to make sure that we visualize the data we're collecting in order to make people understand there is a danger. Something is happening in the ocean, something invisible, but we have all the means to make it change. So that's uh, what we're doing from science to policy. So that's why we're also involved in the world of policymakers to make sure that uh, our leaders are taking action to save our blue planet. So as to conclude, as Nelson Mandela was saying, um, sports has the power to change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So from racing around the world to designing super yachts and we introduce Marnix Hoekstra.
from the world famous Freepak? Are we talking about the initiatives that their company has in this regard? There we go. Thank you. Well, I, I, I have to say I'm hugely humbled uh, by being in this presence of, of people who do significantly more than we do and we would like to do more. Uh, for me, it's, a, it's kind of a personal um, mission I'm on within the company being supported by a lot of people. But, um, you know, sustainability in, in, in your design, it's, it's, a, it's a strange combination, isn't it? I mean, I was always attracted by the technology behind it. So for years, I'm following, you know, um, how can we electrify our boats? And we've done so already in the early 90s, putting old-fashioned um, uh, lead bat batteries in, uh, in, uh, in the Tigre door boat and, and trying to make her hybrid when she sails the, uh, the Indian inland waters in, uh, in Europe. But for me, a, a big turning moment actually was, I think, if I listen well for a lot of people here, is when I became a father uh, and welcomed my first son. And at around the same time, I was uh, asked to speak at the uh, ocean talks of, uh, of Boat International. A uh, bit different than, uh, than these talks, but similar thinking about, you know, how can we do better for the ocean? And I remember vividly, and I will never forget this, engraved in my mind that, that we had a talk about, there was a talk about plastic and how we could, you know, how plastic could go out of the supermarket and we should, you know, give the plastic at the, at the, at the register and I don't want this. And then they invited one way or another a group of, of uh, school children in front row. Obviously older than my son was at the time, but I, I recognized. There was this young, young boy, clear cut hair, blonde, you know. And, and, and he dared to ask a question to this esteemed panel of people on the, on, um, on the, on the stage. And he said, what, what are you, you know, trying to do so plastic doesn't come into, into my life in the future? I thought, this guy's like five, six, seven years later, you know. And, and the panel was answering his question, you know, very polite and correct. And then the only thing he asked, which I never forget, is like, what's taking you so long? And it was just the most sincere thing a young kid could say. It's like to adults, like, guys, wake up, like act. And for me, it really, really switched into gear. It's like, wow, I, I could do something. I have to do something because it will be my kids asking me somewhere down the line. It's like, you're designing these cool boats. You know, I'm, we're having a base here in Monaco. So we're here often with the family. And then we go here and it looks cool. And it's like, but they will ask me these questions. They will... You know, they will put me to the charge, like, what are you doing? What, you have so much possibility, what are you doing? So, it's slow, you know, you're taking your chance, you're fighting a lot of uphill battles, because at the same time, we're running a business, so, yes, we have to design, you know, um, gas guzzling machines as well, and then, then going from one thing on the other. But what we did start within the companies that we said, we want to start this new wave, we've called this. This new wave of possibilities on, on making sustainable an integral part of design. So we set out for a challenge and we said like sustainability for us, for me and my business partner Bart, um, it's not something about like a personal sacrifice. We don't have to live, we believe we don't have to live less because we want to be sustainable. I think we all want to progress, it's human nature, we want to be better. We, we can't say to people don't go to the Arctic, we want to go to the Arctic, but how could we do that in the most responsible way ever, maybe leave the place even better than it was when we were before. So I don't think it's a personal sacrifice, nor do I think it's a political dilemma. It should, I think we need rule makers for sure, this is clear, but it shouldn't be led by rule makers because rule makers will force us into an area where we don't want to be. You know, uh, ballast water treatment is a beautiful example. IMO, it's very rightfully there. But what IMO does is, is, is push us into installing into boats even more stuff than we actually want. And now we have ballast water treatment systems which take fuel and power, and we actually want less on the boat. Um, finally, inspired by a lot of our boats, um, our own, we try to you know, look at this as a design challenge. We believe we can design into the yachts we do sustainable credentials just from the very, very, very beginning. And we're doing that, and we're taking on that challenge on all the various levels. Obviously, with hybrid propulsion, uh, it's kind of you know known we're working on the first world's first fossil-free ship. There will be no internal combustion engine on this 70-meter uh, ship, but there's smaller stuff we can do as well, which is just vital and also easy to retrofit. Um, earlier on, this this uh, this yacht really really led it on. This series of yachts, uh, this is Dardanella, famous 
of our research vessel yacht uh, uh, additions. Turmoil is one of that. Um, she was the first one to cross the Northwest Passage, really specifically built for that, specifically built for that. And it was that owner already at the mid-90s uh, who said to us, I want to do this passage, but I'll do it with scientists. I'm going to collect data during that trip. It's going to be an epic trip. I want to make it. I want to cross this off my bucket list, but I'm going to do it for a purpose. So that led me, us, me and Bart, to think our boats are really coming to very cool places, but also places where there's a lack of actual data in the international databases. And I've learned that actually from uh, uh, watching uh, the Volvo Ocean Race and, uh, and Boris Herman on uh, Melitza. He was very clear on it on social media when he did, did, uh, did the race last year. There, these boats are coming to places where there's no commercial shipping, so there's a very big, big like black uh, hole in data collection. So what we've uh, decided to do is that in every new boat we're designing, and this is active now, and one of the captains we're doing a new boat with will recognize this, we're actually designing integrally into a boat a data collection system. So sometimes somebody asks, like, what's this 19-inch wreck doing here down below? I thought we only had it on the bridge. And that's our little spot on the boat, which we just claim. We're just doing it. We're not asking for permission on it. Where will be the data monitoring uh, uh, system, which will collect uh, plastic particles, CO2, H4O, salinity, all the things we've heard about before, going to be... Um, the, the data will be shared with Koch Institute, other institutes who, who need this data from locations where our boats are going across the world. It's not really a big thing for the owners. Uh, most of the engineers you talk to, they have to do a little bit of work on these, uh, on these machines, but they'll gladly do it because they know they're contributing to a healthier ocean, one thing they're sailing in. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Six. That was fantastic timing. We all know captains as very, very busy people indeed, with a lot of responsibility, with uh, busy days, especially when the owner's on board. So what about captains who also have taken on the responsibility of collecting data? Well, now we invite Captain Matthias Duval, who's the captain of the motor yacht, 50-meter motor yacht, Queen Aida. Just a quick correction to uh, say that I actually handed over Queen Ada to my friend and esteemed colleague Sebastian last year, uh, who is still pursuing this project that we started uh, a couple of years back. Okay. Um, so we talked about uh, data collection before and um, We've seen that there are many types of data that are worth collecting. Um, on board Queen Aida, we wanted to uh, conduct a small, first it was a small experiment uh, in collecting weather data. Uh, what we have seen so far was about collecting uh, hydrographic data, uh, depth, for example, uh, with very uh, simple uh, system, low cost, uh, we could say, uh, high technology, of course, uh, and with very efficient result. Um, there was the small picture uh, on board Queen Aida, let's say, uh, it was working with the team, working with the crew. Uh, we, wanted, uh, we wanted to see our crew involved in, uh, in observing the weather and being part of, um, uh, being part of uh, the, the, the whole process uh, of, uh, of uh, collecting the weather data, analyzing them, and uh, providing them uh, to a weather organization. Um, the Admiral uh, Sinapi, I think, will be a better placed than me to talk about uh, how uh, collecting information is at the DNA of uh, uh, the, the seafarers. And it's been done for, for many years, and it's been, uh, uh, we rely on that uh, to actually work. Uh, the, the hydrographic data uh, collected uh, by the previous seafarers are the one we use today to sell, and the weather data that are collected by seafarers all around the world are the ones that build the models and for long-term uh, prediction of the weather and are also the one that helps uh, predict uh, tomorrow's weather. And uh, there was a sense that we were losing this connection uh, on board uh, between what we observe and uh, what we uh, benefit 
uh, from uh, those uh, weather organization. We all are used now to receive a lot of information. We, we just go online and we get a weather prediction for the next three or four days. Uh, but we forget where it comes from. And uh, it used to be a very closed local loop. Uh, the, the seafarers were looking at the sky, were uh, taking some measurements, and they were uh, understanding what's going to happen. And nowadays, we just check our pieces and look at what is the weather going to be for the next few days. Well, this information, it comes from somewhere. Uh, now the world is bigger, uh, the science is, is stronger, but it relies on something, and it relies on the observation that we can make on board. So we also had a small piece of equipment. Um, I don't know if we can have a look at it somewhere. Uh, installed on board. Very simple. Sorry, I'm discovering the <laughs> picture at the same time. So this is just a, a, a pressure a precision barograph uh, that's connected to a PC and uh, that's piggybacking on the old yacht's equipment, something that's already installed on board. We have GPSs, we have PCs, we have everything that we need uh, to already collect a lot of information. So it takes only a small update, just like uh, this uh, system that will uh, record uh, uh, batigraphic information to record more and to transmit, uh, transmit more information. In our case, we wanted to work on the pressure. Why the pressure? Because it was very simple to install, very cheap actually. The whole system maybe cost uh, less than 2,000 euro to set up. So any yacht can afford that. And also because, well, we share a lot of uh, uh, common uh, interest uh, in, in collecting data with uh, my other colleagues here, but uh, the comparison stopped here. We didn't go to uh, uh, um, uh, exotic destination. Uh, we were mostly Mediterranean bound. And uh, there is actually a lot of interest for collecting massively uh, data in the Mediterranean, because in those areas that are sailed a lot, uh, we try to improve the models and uh, collecting mass of data, uh, even in, in routes that are uh, often sailed, uh, is precious. It's precious for uh, organization uh, like Meteo France that we've been working with to fine tune their model. Uh, so that was the perfect experiment on board Queen Ada uh, to actually uh, install a uh, low-cost system, high-tech, but low-maintenance, so it can be done by any crew, and in, I invite uh, crew members, captains, uh, and owners to join us uh, through the Captain's Club, and Christina has been helping there to try and harness the uh, capacity of the yachting fleet uh, to, to, to gather more data, even if you are not sailing uh, the, the poles, even if you are not going to, uh, through exotic routes, we, we all wish we were, but <laughs> we don't often have this, uh, this possibility. You, you can also participate. You can also uh, bring a, a piece to the puzzle. Uh, that's uh, actually the, the tomorrow's model. Uh, it helps science. It helps uh, evaluate the effect of uh, global warming. We know that uh, the, the weather and climate are intricated together, okay? So the models that we are working on uh, it helps us understand what is going on also uh, on the long term. So it was, a, it was an interesting project to carry on. It's a simple one. That's what I wanted to insist on. And uh, we've proved that uh, we can do that for uh, depth information. We can do that uh, for meteorological information. It's a project that can be conducted with families, uh, with crew members. Uh, so we get to involve people to have them participate uh, and it, I think this is the idea of the yachting with more sense and uh, yachting with more purpose. So that's what we, uh, we've been trying to do. Perfect. Thank you very much indeed. Well, a lot of what we've discussed so far has been um, actions of collecting data, of where to put the data collection box, of uh, how much it costs, how to fit it. But now we'll talk to the man who is really responsible for this drive to have a hub to which all of this data goes and can be analysed and so that the world can really benefit from it. And of course is Admiral Luigi Sinapi, Admiral of the Italian Navy and also the Director of Organisazione Hydrographique Internationale.
So thank you very much, David, for uh, the presentation. And uh, thank you, the Yacht Club of Monaco and uh, Foundation Prince Albert II for this opportunity. It's a, it is a unique opportunity. Um, they decided to put this... Uh, this picture of myself, uh, it's not the best. Uh, I, can, uh, I can switch uh, <laughs> quickly to the presentation because uh, it was uh, some kilos ago. And uh, <laughs> I, don't want to, I don't want to bore you with, uh, with my ugly pictures and photos. Um, I'm here for uh, responding to a question uh, and also to attract, uh, to draw your attention uh, on the possibility for the yachting industry, for all the yachting, uh, uh, for all the, the yachting family, the captains, uh, for my former colleagues, I was captain a uh, few times, uh, only four years in the, in the Italian Navy, uh, to contribute to a dream. I, will, I would say a dream because uh, the dream uh, is uh, the full map of the ocean. And uh, this dream, uh, uh, born uh, in uh, 1903, thanks to Prince Albert I, and uh, with the launch of uh, the general bathymetric chart of the ocean. And uh, as uh, my predecessor said, uh, uh, Marnix, uh, <laughs> about, uh, about having a purpose for the collection of data. I will give you the purpose, because uh, uh, all the data you're going to collect uh, I hope the majority of you, I hope all of you, all of the, 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 the participating at the, the, yacht, uh, the yachting family, we go to feed a database, a world database, for mapping the ocean. And uh, uh, as you know, the super yachts uh, explore the world, and, uh, uh, and they go, as we saw a, a lot of beautiful pictures uh, before, uh, of, yachting, of yachts going uh, in, uh, almost undiscovered parts of the world, uh, and uh, where the data is scarce, uh, is sparse, uh, um, uh, very often is not available at all. And uh, uh, using very simple devices, uh, as uh, uh, my dear friend Fabrice uh, shown, and I will talk about that a little bit later, uh, you can f uh, concretely contribute to populating the database and give the opportunity to use this data to the all humankind. We are calling this uh, with, a, uh, with a new name, a sort of, uh, the phila of a philanthropy for the ocean that we renamed uh, digital philanthropy. So each of you can contribute to this uh, digital philanthropy. How? Joining one of uh, the, these global initiatives in favor of uh, the knowledge of the ocean, as I said, uh, we started uh, uh, in 1903 with the general bathymetric chart of the ocean with uh, that visionary man, uh, Prince Albert I. And then other initiatives that were launched in the, in the last, uh, I would say, 10 years. With, uh, uh, in 20, uh, 2015, the IHO, the International Hydrographic Organization, where the site is just in front of you on the other side of the port uh, of the harbor, uh, we launched this crowdsource bathymetry. What's the crowdsource bathymetry? It, the, the possibility for any kind of vessel engaged in routine uh, navigations uh, to collect data using uh, the instruments. They have the routine instruments, uh, the standard instruments on board. Uh, a satellite positioning system plus uh, an eco sounder. That's it, to, to collect this data. In 2017, uh, the other a worldwide uh, initiative uh, launched by the Nippon Foundation uh, was started here in Monaco. Again, when, uh, uh, when uh, uh, the president of the Nippon Foundation declared to have a dream, the dream to map the entire ocean by 2030. And then, uh, as, you, as you know, we are living uh, in a decade completely dedicated to the oceans. It is the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And uh, all these initiatives are contributing to the purpose that uh, my dear friend said before, the purpose of mapping the ocean. Here you have the map, the, the, the worldwide grid of, uh, of, the, of our ocean uh, since from uh, uh, 2018 to 2021. In the last, uh, and in the last uh, 
uh, four years, uh, you can see a great increase, uh, increase of, the, of the data available, available to everybody. And uh, uh, the, the, the numbers of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of the coverage of the seabed uh, has increased a lot. In fact, uh, we started from a coverage of 6.7% of the seabed in 2018, and we are now at the end of 2021 at 21.6%. Thanks to whom? Thanks to all those they want to be contributors. And I'm saying uh, not only the hydrographic services, uh, the scientific research centers, uh, the survey ships, uh, the going at sea for collecting data, but also thanks to the contribution to all of you, they want to contribute to this dream. And how? Using very simple devices, you, we, we saw the simple devices to connect uh, to an eco sounder uh, to a, a, a positioning system on board through uh, the normal exit from uh, of this uh, of this uh, two equipment these data go to the the so-called trusted node they are the data aggregators so they are organization university uh, research centers uh, or centers that they, they they are able to collect this data to analyze this data supplying uh, the data loggers for free, less than the 200 euros that uh, we mentioned before, and uh, all this data go and feed the data center for digital bathymetry. That's the universal data center for all the data of the seabed uh, of our oceans. And uh, this is, uh, as I said, uh, a dream, but uh, we can see from uh, the last uh, couple of years uh, having uh, almost 200 contributing vessels for uh, almost 275,000 data contributions for an amount of uh, almost 25 gigabyte total data volume. So the message I want to deliver is uh, to all of you, come on board and be an acting leaders of this, uh, of this dream to get the 100% of our seabed known by 2030. And uh, we had also a beautiful example from, uh, from Monaco, because Monaco is uh, fully engaged uh, on, this, uh, on this adventure, this challenging adventure, thanks to Sir Ernst, uh, that, uh, that show what, uh, what they collected using exactly those data loggers provided by the, uh, by the trusted node and uh, all the others that they want to join this, uh, this experience. That's the most challenging uh, adventure for mapping the ocean. Thank you very much Thank for you the very attention. Much. I have a feeling there'll be plenty of questions afterwards as well uh, <laughs> on, on that part of the, of the program. Now we come to the part about noise pollution, the part that I kind of questioned at one point, uh, the level of interest, but I did, then discovered it's an extremely interesting subject. So I'm happy to introduce to you uh, Michel André, a professor and a bioacoustician, as well as being the director of the Applied Bioacoustics at the Technical University of Catalonia, Barcelona Tech. Thank you, David. I enjoyed when you explained about your uh, um, journey with the uh, wine list and being able to uh, to uh, uh, rec recall all the, the, this data. Uh, this is something that our our brain is not able to do. But now we have some machines that uh, could do that, and I'm uh, trying to uh, explain how some machine uh, can uh, truly help uh, having access to this remote data. Uh, I would like to thank the yacht, the yacht Club to bring science uh, to this um, um, uh, time because uh, science was born. To serve, uh, to serve society, and now we have this opportunity to have society serving science, and in a way that, as, as we just saw, uh, we have all these um, uh, uh, yachts and, and ships that can um, uh, bring data uh, from uh, places uh, that we don't have access to, and uh, these cross sources or uh, uh, um, cross sources science or uh, citizen science is something that we need to rely on. Uh, I'm going to speak about noise, but before I speak uh, uh, about noise, I, I would like to um, 
um, go back to what uh, um, Prince Albert II said uh, regarding the need of taking a pulse of nature. This is time. We know that nature is getting to a point where we might uh, see it in the next uh, years with a different eye or a different ear, like I hope. But uh, time is, is really tight, and uh, we need really to, uh, to bring all the effort and the technology to uh, take the personal nature, to be alerted of some uh, time where uh, there will be a rupture and uh, a breaking point that will be too late to act. So we have this opportunity now. And then um, we also heard uh, uh, from uh, doc doc Dr. Earl that um, the ocean is the uh, parts of the Antarctica, of, um, of Antarctica ignored. We, we are ignoring uh, the, um, uh, the uh, state of uh, conservation of uh, the ocean. We are paying attention to land, we are paying attention to the different uh, species that live on, on land, but we have not yet uh, taken uh, any action in terms of uh, how we can uh, limit the impact of uh, human activities in the ocean, specifically in these two regions, in the, in the poles where we have still the chance not to uh, do again the same um, uh, mistakes that we uh, uh, did in the past in the rest of, of, of the world. So uh, we have a chance to do that and uh, yachting with sense makes a lot of sense because sense is something uh, that, that we understand uh, as an objective but also as the way that we perceive uh, the current environment. And if there is a sense that we all share on Earth, creatures being plants, uh, animals, aquatic or land-based, is sound. This is the only sense that we know of. Uh, maybe there, there are uh, other senses that we don't yet know of, but from the, fifth, uh, the five senses that we know of, this is the only support of information that we all share. And this is a, a fact that we can use to take the pulse of nature. We can uh, use the technology to listen to nature and specifically to listen underwater. This is something that we couldn't do uh, 30 or 40 years ago. Now we have the technology to put a smart ears underwater and listen to nature and go back to understand what is going wrong with uh, the effect of human activity and to contribute uh, to the object to cohabit, to coexist with nature, uh, with uh, our uh, human activity. So going back to the poles and to Antarctica, uh, we uh, started with the Yacht Club uh, three years ago to think of a way uh, how yachts could contribute to get data uh, uh, of biodiversity in these two regions where we lack of data to set some uh, protocols when the ice uh, uh, has, um, has melt or melts, and this will be quick. We know that maybe in five to 10 years time, uh, we won't have ice in, in the summer uh, in the Arctic. And uh, to be able to uh, set some ecological uh, corridor, some uh, actions to protect biodiversity, we need to have baseline data. And this can be provided by uh, acoustic. <laughs> How ironic is that? <laughs> Do we have another microphone? All right, sorry about that, it's funny. So um, we, we can use sound uh, to um, get this uh, fundamental data on the status of biodiversity. And we uh, thought of a way of uh, uh, having this complicity with the yachts, uh, bringing the technology in a way that uh, no one has to be an expert uh, on board. We, uh, we just heard uh, from, from what we uh, saw that uh, we can bring technology that, do, that doesn't need experts to operate, but that would give us the access to the data without having anyone to uh, know exactly what the system does, but being on a board it gathers the data, the acoustic data, adding a camera, underwater camera, that brings also data with what uh, we can capture as a sound. And this data can be sent automatically to the servers where they are um, analyzed. And this is a, a device uh, that you can see uh, on the screen that uh, was tested for the first time in Antarctica in uh, March uh, 2020. Uh, and it consists of this simple spatial designed um, a shuttle, a sort of uh, uh, high-tech um, uh, buoy that captures the sound, uh, analyzes it, uh, identifies the different sound sources, gives uh, a name to these sound sources, and uh, provide uh, uh, what we call eco-acoustics uh, indices, which is uh, uh, meant to be able to give you 
the uh, status of, of conservation of the area where this buoy is uh, put um, in the water. So uh, this is something that is now uh, ready to be uh, done. Uh, I, um, I can encourage the uh, captains and uh, the owners uh, to uh, participate. As we just heard, we need you. Uh, the, there is this dream of um, having a map of uh, the whole ocean. Uh, there is another dream, <laughs> which is uh, to have this uh, mapping of sounds, because as I just said when we started, is sound is really the support of information that we'll all share, and being able to monitor the sound will be able to work towards a future of humankind, because we cannot ignore that uh, the ocean is our life, and the ocean is life, and the sound is life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Moving on, we're going to now discuss um, a yacht built by a very famous shipyard, one of the most famous shipyards, Fed Ship, called Archimedes, that's actually been active in data collection for National Geographic. And to discuss that, we invite Farouk Nepsi. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you, Michel Andre, for that little introduction, because it's uh, absolutely important. So I thought, well, um, um, uh, Christina is not here, but she said, listen, you have five minutes, no PowerPoint, and you have to tell a story. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. But before doing that, when you were telling your story, I thought, let's start with something that you were talking about. I hope everybody can hear this. Bowhead whales that were captured during the Arctic travel of Archimedes. Before I start telling that story, and I know this is all within the five minutes, um, I just wanted to uh, just recap a little bit about this industry. I know there's a, there are a lot of owners um, that have told their story about how they are participating and contributing to the sustainability element. And as an industry, we are all uh, doing our best and and if you look at the non yachting media if you look at all the landscape around us it comes across as if we're not doing enough and yes we are never doing enough but I would like to contribute uh, to uh, uh, to tribute um, the industry but also the owners I was uh, speaking at a, uh, a conference um, uh, a few weeks ago in Hamburg and I heard a beautiful story from uh, Baltic yachts um, Lursen was giving a, uh, a beautiful presentation about, um, um, about their latest innovation uh, using fuel cell technology um, in combination with, um, with, uh, with hydrogen and uh, methanol. Um, unfortunately, uh, we are not, as FETCHIP, we are not allowed to talk about that, so I'm not telling you that we're also doing that. Um, but the thing is this, is that that technology, that le level of innovation, is being put into place and we are investing in it simply because we feel the need and we have to because if you're not into the course of sustainability it's not a competitive advantage it's simply a matter of being in or out so that is basically i think the ground rule of the whole sustainability topic and i would like to thank the owners for giving that opportunity also because they finally also uh, uh, invest in this whole drive for doing better. Ha having that said, um, we, you could give an applause, by the way, to, uh, to the owners. Um, and I'm sorry for all the millennials and uh, Gen Z generations, we're not going to talk about NFTs or metaverses today. <laughs> And you have to, to pay attention how uh, um, uh, the technology of mining is contributing to sustainability. So, um, yes, I have to tell the story. I was asked to tell the story about Archimedes, um, which is a 68-meter uh, fed ship. And the owner, when 
uh, building. I didn't even know that they were going to have pictures or not. But um, uh, the yacht was um, was built in uh, in 2008, and the owner uh, requested basically to um, yeah to explore the world. They wanted to see every corner of the world, uh, but the yacht had to be built, um, but not being built ice class because they also wanted to do um, the Arctic. So they have. I strengthened the yacht, which means, and I have to read that, that the first half of the yacht is, is, um, um, it has more scantlings and enhanced thickness, so to, in, to be enabled to, uh, um, uh, to, to drive to the, to the Arctic. And it became, in 2017, one of the longest Arctic adventures um, and expedition that was going to take place. It was a 54-day uh, um, uh, travel. Um, doing five and a half thousand nautical miles and it required a lot of nautical planning uh, and of course na uh, uh, careful navigation. Set aside the element of uh, a data collection, the whole uh, initiative was actually a, an awareness campaign and that's why National Geographic came on board to not only collect data, but all put it into visuals. Because if you look into the world, the element of awareness still needs everyday um, attention, if you will, to get everybody to understand the whole picture. And it started um, all in, um, in Greenland and ended also in, uh, in Greenland. Uh, the goals were to admire wildlife, of course, you've listened to uh, a, a little uh, noise fragment of that, uh, but to also see the glaciers and to also uh, uh, observe the receding and um, make sure that the awareness factor was put into picture to such an element that it speaks to all generation. And that is being used until today by National Geographic with a lot of publications and, and uh, uh, video videography that, uh, as of today. To, to enable themselves to do that, they had to collect a, a group of specialists to, uh, to sail along with them. So I have to mention the names because it was very carefully planned. Uh, we had, uh, they had marine bi biologist uh, uh, Paul Nicken, he's, who's also by the way, photographer and filmmaker. Um, they had uh, National Ge Geographic contributor Justin Hoffman, um, uh, Tim Scoper of EOS uh, Expeditions, um, a team of experts to really make sure that they didn't do the wrong navigation or uh, end up into problems. And they had a lot of beautiful encounters. Um, they've seen the uh, uh, close encounters with a polar bear, with a cub, um, that was um, minding their own business and they had to turn off the engines because they were respecting the noise levels uh, as, as just was, uh, was explained. And they had to uh, cruise with their, uh, with their uh, stern thrusters. Um, doing that, they also captured uh, in that way the, uh, the singing of the, uh, of the bowhead whales. And um, this expedition actually gained so much data and, and uh, made beautiful footage that is, again, a part of an awareness campaign and, and hopefully it will uh, uh, continue to contrib contribute to that. And it's because of these initiatives, um, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll have more awareness and with that, a lot more action. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for it. Thank you. So we're moving on into the uh, time when you can ask questions and, and just let you know, apart from the speakers that you've already heard, we have um, in attendance um, Mathieu, you have to excuse my pronunciation here, Bel Belbioc, who's the manager of IOC WMO Ocean Ops, here to answer any questions that you may have. Dr. Celine Lobohek from Polar Biology Research Fellow of the uh, CNRS and Hervé Perrin who was involved with the expedition of Sir Ernst as well. Bearing in mind that we have all of these people here, as well as the speakers, uh, we invite any questions that you have. Yes, please, Dr. Sylvia Earle. Yes, just partly an observation, partly a question that much attention is now being addressed to mapping the seafloor that has been neglected for so long. We map the surface, but what's missing is the ocean itself and life in the ocean. 
we're doing a better, increasingly better job of mapping marine mammals, partly because we can hear them. We're doing an increasingly good job of mapping fish because we can hear and see them with sonar. Still, the ocean is truly alive with life from the surface to the greatest depths and even below the bottom of the ocean in the cracks where water drizzles down one or two kilometers with life, small creatures, all the way down. The question is evaluating the importance of that living carbon and understanding that we are not even a tenth of the way toward where we need to be in terms of assessing not only the amount of life that currently exists, but how much is being extracted. And with a particular reference to Antarctica, where there's such attention to being careful as cruise ships, those who come to admire and respect Antarctica, and those who come to extract krill and fish and other creatures, which has a dramatic impact on the carbon cycle and therefore on, on um, climate. And I guess the question to anyone who cares to step up, especially <laughs> our panelists, what do we do? How do we, how do we, just because we don't know the answers doesn't mean we should not be taking it into account with a precautionary principle and do whatever we can to protect these fragile places and have a magnified impact. We, we've, we've always, it seems we keep going with exploitation in mind of taking. And isn't it time to step back and think about enhancing protection for not just the waters around Antarctica where the Ross Sea is the dominant place currently protected, but overall only 3% of the ocean is proactively protected. 97% is open for exploitation. And what might we, you, all of us, do about it? Thank you very much. Any of our panelists? <laughs> do any of our panelists care to comment on that? Michelle? Yes, Sylvia, thank you very much. This is absolutely right. Um, and uh, we, we usually have not paid attention to anything that was not um, uh, something that, that we could see or we cannot hear and not see this is our uh, problem uh, because human beings, what we don't see, what we don't hear doesn't exist. And we have all these uh, aspects of the ocean that we don't see because except you and all uh, who go uh, underwater, uh, no one goes underwater. So no one sees it and no one knows it. And so we ignore it. And uh, this is time uh, truly to put uh, the technology. And we heard uh, some some of the aspects. But if I can come back to uh, to sound, when when we understand that uh, uh, sound is really uh, the sense that we can use to understand the balance uh, of any habitat, but specifically uh, the uh, seas and the, and the ocean, because even though all the animals do not produce sound, if you have the presence of the prey, uh, sorry, of the uh, of the predators, then you know that the prey are there. So uh, being able to monitor bioacoustically the ocean brings us as a proxy to the biological activity. And then we can build trends and we can uh, understand that when these trends are made, and this is of course a dynamic uh, process, any alteration to this trend coming from uh, uh, human activity or climate change will be uh, alerting us that something is, is going wrong. So there is this emergency now to, uh, to, to take action. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I just pick up on, on a, a quick point to Michelle while you have the microphone? Um, I mentioned earlier about getting close to a very large loudspeaker and how I could feel the vibrations through my body, but is noise, how damaging is noise to living creatures in the ocean? I mean, will it kill them? Will it give them a headache? What's the, what's the real effect? Yes, these effects are, are coming from uh, the list of these effects that is masking the information that uh, living creation needs to um, uh, um, uh, bring and to uh, 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 God get. So this masking uh, is one of these list of, of the problem, but you can, you can still make some uh, strike uh, collisions where else can, can lose the capacity to detect ships and then they can uh, collide and then die uh, from, from, uh, from the strike. And then we have on the other extreme, 
sources of sound that can be uh, like a lethal, they can kill uh, to a distance up to 500 meters, uh, one kilometers. If the sound source is high and the potential sound source is oil and gas operation, uh, Navy maneuvers, uh, the building of, uh, uh, of, uh, of wind, wind, windmills, this uh, pr produces sound sources with a, a amplitude high enough to kill any living creature at this, uh, at this distance. And in between these two extremes, the, uh, this, this masking effect and this lethal effect, then you have what, what we call acoustic trauma. That is when you are exposed to a sound source for uh, time enough, your uh, system, your organs that is responsible to hear sound gets tired and then it gets to a point that, the way that there is a permanent, uh, um, um, a permanent uh, um, damage effect, yeah. damage that makes you deaf to the sound. And this is uh, condemning uh, this creature that, as I said, this is the only way of exchanging information is sound. Uh, underwater, light doesn't get more than a few meters before the, the surface, uh, below the, uh, yes, uh, and sound is the only way for them to, to communicate. So affecting this, we are uh, killing uh, the, the, uh, the possibility of, of the ocean to survive. Thank you very much. I saw that the microphone was passed to a gentleman as well towards the back. Could we have your comments? Yes, uh, I, I just want to, let's say, I was, <laughs> let's say, uh, dis uh, disturbed by Sylvia L's uh, talk because we really need everybody to get involved in this, everybody. And uh, I'm not a scientist, so thank you to all the scientists like Sylvia and all others you in the room to help in this, solving this issue. Uh, but there are some little issues we can, which we can solve already now. Uh, this morning, uh, actually this afternoon was fantastic, the, the way it was done. A lot of uh, scientific information, a lot of practical information from, from everybody. But this morning we talked, somebody, I think Mr. Kempf, uh, mentioned about the IATO organization. And the IATO organization make a fantastic field operational manual. Uh, which is published on the internet and with, uh, let's say, helps. Uh, it's like a guidelines how to behave in the areas which are so fragile for the environment, what uh, uh, Sylvia talked to us also. So there are uh, all the guidelines how to approach penguins, how to not to fly the helicopters in the vicinity of the birds, not to disturb the animals and things like that. From the even including operations in the polar waters, which are not even happening right now. So they, they went even ahead, if, because some people are organizing marathons in Antarctica. So how to organize this kind of, uh, let's say, operation too. So there is more or less everything is covered, so I really would like that all the yacht owners, all the uh, yacht operators, go to that YATO operational manual, field operational manual, and have a look, because there is a lot of good information down there. Right, thank you. And, and also one more thing. Uh, we should also think about training of the people who are going to Antarctica, or to Arctic, to the polar regions. Training the officer, training the crew, training everybody, because uh, I remember I started sailing with the ships with no technology, which was <laughs> quite dangerous, I must say. But now we have too much in t in technology and there is no trained people. So there's also two subjects which can uh, be also looked at by your organization in the future. Sylvia, thank you very much for uh, inspiration to yeah. answer this one. <laughs> at the end. No, I didn't want to say anything, but I said I agree with you. Training of the officer especially on the yachting. It's uh, tremendously important. Thank you. I hear a voice. I don't see where it came from, but it was a valid point. <laughs> <laughs> any, any more questions? Uh, I have uh, something to add here. We have uh, two interesting person. We need to, uh, to introduce to you because there are new conventions that uh, they are being studied and we have the best here to let us know more about. So, uh, yes, uh, so I'm uh, Anne Choquet. I am a researcher of law at the Brest University. And uh, so my research topics are environmental protection, 
governance of Antarctica and so on. And uh, I would like to, to say that um, even if we think that Antarctica is very beautiful, there is no freedom of activities. We have to be very careful. And we have to be very careful because we have treaties, we have a lot of regulations, and we have to improve these regulations because we have new activities and we don't know really how to do, we have to improve our regulations. And in fact, I'm very impressed today because uh, yes, we need this data. But what I, I would like to, to say though, because I am the vice president of the French Committee for Antarctic and Arctic Research. We need, of course, this data, but we need also scientists. And in fact, we have not enough money for scientists. Even if we have this data, we need scientists. We need people working on these data. And of course, we should have shape of opportunities for data. But we don't have to also have science of opportunity. We need to share our yeah, opportunities to re really understand, improve what we know on Antarctica or also uh, for, for the Arctic. And we need also money for your, our young researchers. You know, it is very difficult for us to have new researchers. We would like to have PhD students, for example, or students trying to understand, to see what we can do. Can, can we accept this idea of a mixed activity, science and tourism? Shall we improve or shall we stop and say no? Antarctica is too difficult to share everything. So we need to really to, to try to understand, to study, to go on and to go with everybody we need, with scientists, of course, economical companies, uh, association, society in general. And we have to really to share and to give these people to the opportunity to, to go to Antarctica and to explain what happens there. Can I ask you, is the, is the biggest challenge the cost of getting scientists to Antarctica or is the biggest challenge there aren't enough scientists in that field? I would say I am a specialist in law, so really I don't need to go there to, to study law, to, uh, to study environmental protection, but what I, I need is to have a team for identifying, uh, doing some elements together. And of course, we, we need to go to Antarctica, we need to go to the Arctic, but we work at home, we work in our university, and then we need uh, yes, help for, for this. Thank you very much indeed, uh, thank you. Any more thank questions? Thank you. Any more questions? Maybe if I, if I allow, uh, I will take the follow-up of uh, Anne, so I'm Jérôme Chapelaz, I'm the executive director of the French Polar Institute. So this is the institutional um, agency uh, paid by the government to handle science in Arctic, Antarctica and the subantarctic regions. So we send something like 350 scientists per year in these fields to conduct science related with all topics uh, about the ocean, about the atmosphere, about astronomy, about uh, biology and so on. Um, this is an engaging work. We have the responsibility of people, we have the responsibility of their life, and uh, we have the responsibility to produce a very good science for the help of society. Um, I would uh, second what uh, Anne said. You know, understanding what's going on today in the Arctic Ocean, in the Austral, in the Austral Ocean, and in Antarctica, requires observation, and it's, it's tedious. It takes time, it takes a lot of energy, and it pays off on the long term. And I must say it's more and more difficult uh, to actually support that because people want to get uh, feedback on this activity on very short term. But understanding what's going on in the Arctic and Antarctica requires long-term observation. I will take a few examples. Uh, if you speak about future sea level, global sea level, there is a potential of increase of sea level by 50 to 60 meters 
if Antarctica melts. It will not melt down in, in a few centuries or a few millennia, but we know that the process is already uh, occurring right now. And it all depends on what happens between the Austral Ocean and platforms of geysers floating on the ocean. What happens between the ocean and the ice shelves, we don't know. We don't have any observation. Nobody has been able to go there uh, at you know, a few hundreds of meters of depth below the ice to understand what's going on. So we need observations and we need support. Uh, I would like to thank the organization of this special event because I get to know a uh, population, the Yacht Club, I didn't know before. I uh, feel that there is engagement, there is a will to support science, and I would like to applaud that. I don't think we need to oppose what is public science, and I would say science supported by private uh, support, like the Yacht Club, and I would really encourage to push for that. Uh, I take the example of the company Ponant and the Commandant Charcot, Etienne Garcia spoke about it this morning. Uh, we're in the process of putting together a collaboration with the company to make the best possible science out of this fantastic icebreaker. And it's not a go or no go, we, it's a go. We clearly have to do, to do that to understand better what's going on in this difficult environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have a question as well from, uh, from a gentleman here. You can tell us first uh, who you are to give us some context. Yes, good afternoon. Mathieu Belbeoc, World Mythological okay. Association. I have to apologize. It would be the third Britain to take the floor in a row, my two colleagues from Brest. Uh, so I'd like to, to, to elaborate a little bit on the observation. First, to thank Monaco for leading again a big uh, uh, ocean week. And right now in the uh, International Hydrographic Organization, some scientists are thinking how they can operate their profiling floats be below the ice. This is a marvelous uh, Argo program, maybe you heard about that. Uh, about 20 years ago, some scientists had the vision to deploy thousands of those profiling robots in the ocean to, to measure climate change. And after 15 years, uh, the year was complete and the trend was clear. So yes, we need observations, governments, Investment in observations, in situ observation in particular, are weak, I would say, simply. Uh, many reasons for that, but that's clear. Um, so we need support. And we hope one day we can convince the government to, to invest at a proper level into that. But meanwhile, there's a huge appetite in civil society. We've seen many examples today uh, of citizens, businessmen, sportsmen, to do something, and they can. We've seen they can do hydrography, they can do weather, oceanography, physical oceanography, biogeochemical oceanography. So you, you know, the, the, the history of Earth and ocean observation started with mariners. Shipmasters were sharing their weather information 150 years ago. And some of our colleagues in Antarctica still do the same, almost manually. But you have a ship, and you're going not only at the coast, but uh, in remote areas, you can do plenty of things. And I think for a very reasonable price. You can equip your ship with this little 200 box uh, uh, um, device. You can have a weather station. You can have an ocean pack. You can get with you some of these profiling robots, drop them wherever you are. So there are huge potential, because in the global ocean observing system today, about 2,000 ships operating 10,000 elements on the, on the ocean, but 2,000 ships. So with a, with a launch by the United Nations of the UN Decade for Ocean Science, uh, uh, a few of us sharing the dream of same dream than some of you, we launched the Odyssey project, which uh, ambition is to regroup all those initiatives by the civil society, citizens, private, to provide observation to the global ocean observing system. Uh, so we'll continue to build that, but I can tell you, you, have a, you can have a big impact, operational impact, because when you're going in those southern ocean, satellite cannot see air pressure, nobody goes there, it's very hard to drop instrument, you can be very useful operationally speaking, but you can also be witnesses and, and, and ambassadors. You can tell the story, because often uh, citizens, sportsmen, like Boris Herman and some other of the ocean race, they can tell how it's important to observe the ocean and far better than scientists. 
So we need your help. I'm, I'm reiterating that call. Please join us. Uh, you can be extremely useful in whatever you do, wherever you go. You can make many observations and share that with the international community to improve your own weather forecast, to improve the climate, to improve the climate understanding, the ocean health understanding. There are so many things that can be done by, by citizens, of course, in very close cooperation with scientists. But today we have a lot of autonomous instruments, devices, sensors, that can just be black boxes on your ship and transmit good quality data that would be ingested by models and be used today and tomorrow. So, thank you very join much. Us. <laughs> just, uh, just picking up on your point there about, uh, about everybody getting involved and also the gentleman's comments when he said, I'm not a scientist. That resonated with me because I'm certainly not a scientist at all, but um, I'm a communicator. And I had an interesting conversation with Charles Dentz uh, at lunch, who's also a communicator and a marketeer. And it seems to me that some of the problem is a lack of awareness. It's a lack of awareness of, of the problem. It's, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of how little of the sea of the ocean has been mapped, how little we know about it. So I guess it's for every person to see what they can do to push the problem back a little bit or to push the solution forward a little bit, whether by communicating, making people more aware, if they're yacht owners, by getting involved with feeding back data, if you're a crew, by encouraging the owner to do that, everybody needs to have a part of it. The most important question, of course, is for Christina. Can we go for a coffee or, uh, <laughs> or do we I do think, some more yes, questions? this is the time. Oh, excellent. Okay. I invite everybody for a coffee. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you, all the speakers. Thank you, attendants, <laughs> I captains, owners. I just want to say something. We, speak, we spoke about a lot of uh, sustainability and all the things we can do, and the kind of awareness Yacht Club de Monaco is providing at the selling school of the Yacht Club. Uh, uh, a training uh, session uh, ethic called here with uh, Claire Fréandier. Maybe you can just finish with some words. Uh, hi everyone, thank you, uh, thank you, okay, I'm going just here. Um, I'm really happy to hear many things about awareness and uh, education because I think we don't need to be scientists to help your industry to change. Um, just a little bit about my story. I'm, I study psychology, I'm from Caribbean and I arrived in South of France and I start to, yacht, to work in the yachting industry as a stewardess, and then I became a chief stewardess. And then I realized after four years cruising uh, as a chief stewardess on the 44 meters, um, the ocean was really dirty after uh, two days raining in Capri, so guests couldn't uh, swim. And I was like really not happy because, oh my God, we're on holidays and we can't swim, so I realized, um, how we are working on board and uh, why we have no um, education, why we don't have any um, training to help us to change uh, our daily activity and to reduce our uh, consumption on board because for sure we consume too much. But it's not like we have to reduce, but we have to consume uh, in a different way. So I decided to create the training because that doesn't exist. So I trained myself with the ISO standard 40001, and then I create my own environmental uh, management system on board that uh, you can uh, use in uh, every department on board for in the, with the deck area, in the uh, engine room, with the uh, chef cook, uh, and also lots of chief officer can do many stuff uh, inside the bridge. So um, after this, uh, two years working very hard to create this training and uh, now the training is about in La Belle Class Academy and uh, I'm developing also consulting for shipyards. They want to raise awareness for the crew, for the new build uh, to, to work differently and to change the business model just to reduce your consumption and to um, raise awareness to everyone. Voilà. Thank you very Thank much. You, Claire. Thank you everyone. So now uh, David and myself propose you to have a coffee. <laughs> Thank you.
good afternoon. Marche pas.